Thanks, Alistair. So there's much to talk about. Let's get straight to our panel. Joining us here in Washington is Eric Olson. He's a senior advisor at the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute and deputy director of its Latin American program. David Shirk heads the Justice in Mexico project at the University of San Diego, where he teaches political science and international relations. Here in the studio, Juan Carlos Hidalgo. He's a Latin America policy analyst at the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C. And joining us via Skype is Mexican law professor Alejandro Madrazo. He is currently a visiting human rights fellow at the Yale Law School in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, Alejandro, let's start with you. We heard from Alistair there um, that it's about drugs, but why so many killings in Mexico last year, Alejandro? Well, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint specifically why last year was particularly high. And the answer would certainly have to look at the specifics of localities where the criminality rose, where homicides rose. Uh, homicides didn't rise across the country. They've always risen in certain cities or in certain counties, certain regions or certain states. So the specifics of why this year and why in those cities is difficult to assess. The general answer, however, is relatively clear by now. The main driver behind the violence over the last 10 years is the militarization of the war on drugs. It is the deployment of military units to carry out police functions that has been the main driver in the rise of homicides in two different ways. On one part, it's the exercise of violence directly by the state. The military are not trained to do police work, and they very often incur in both torture and excessive use of force, which sometimes uh, has ended up in extrajudicial executions. And secondly, the incentive when there is a military force present of the cartels is to arm themselves up. So you have an escalation, a, a, a race uh, of escalation of uh, more and more arms, more and more weapons and larger uh, illicit armies when the army appears. So ironically, it is the war on drugs that is the main driver for the homicide rate rise over the last 10 years, which is peaking at this point. Eric, do you agree with that? It's, a, it's, a, it's an arms race between the military and, uh, 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 and the drug gangs. Uh, I mean, President Peña Nieto came into power promising to reduce the violence. It did go down a bit, but now it's, it, it's way up. Is that the government's response? Fight fire with fire? It has well, been, and I think it has, as, as Alejandro said, contributing to greater violence. Uh, part of the strategy originally of the Calderon administration was to break up some very, very powerful uh, uh, cartels and, they did and make, El Chapo make, them, and, make yeah. them smaller. Uh, and then, presumably, the local authorities would take care of the smaller groups. The problem was that as you broke them up, the local authorities had no capacity. We know the local police, the state police had no capacity to stop them, to, to keep them uh, and, and, and pursue them. So they have, uh, in fact, made smaller groups that then compete amongst each other, and that bribes up the homicide rate. And I think to that extent, Alejandro is correct. The lack of capacity of police and justice system in Mexico is also a factor. It's not all about drugs. It's the state's incapacity to respond. David, um, Eric just came up with a point that uh, the breaking up of some big uh, cartels created vacuum, David. Um, El Chapo, for example, who was extradited here to the U.S. Is that a case now? We've seen a sort of splintering of the major cartels? I think that's very much uh, a, a part of the explanation. Alejandro mentioned that certain parts of the country uh, have seen more violence than others. And, and the parts of the country uh, where we've particularly seen uh, more violence happen to be places where uh, the Chapo Guzman organization mm. uh, or his branch of the Sinaloa cartel had formerly had things under control. Uh, and after his uh, second, or uh, after his recapture uh, back in 2015 and his ultimate uh, extradition to the United States in early 2017, uh, we saw other organizations, particularly the New Generation Cartel, uh, uh, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, mm. uh, moving in to try to take advantage and, and going to war, essentially, with the remnants of Chapo's organization. Uh, so I think that uh, th there's certainly many negative effects of, of the militarization strategy, uh, but the strategy that many people uh, refer to as the kingpin strategy, going after top organized crime leaders, uh, taking them out, and then watching the, uh, the, the, the melee that ensues in the power vacuum, 
I think that is, is a major driver of the violence that we've seen over the last uh, couple of years. Juan Carlos, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to add something. It's ironic because when President Felipe Calderón, just coming into power in December 2006, decided to deploy the, arm, the army to fight this the This is the cartels. beginning of the war on drugs. This is the, the, the official beginning of the war on drugs, although we already had episodes uh, prior to yeah. that of the cartels confronting each other, particularly the organization of Chapo Gurman trying to invade the territory of other cartels. But officially, when, when President Felipe Calderón came to power and decided to deploy the army, Mexico had the lowest crime rate in decades back, back then. Uh, it wasn't because we were particularly witnessing a rise in crime uh, when, when President Felipe Calderón decided that. Actually, just the opposite. The moment the, the army is began to be deployed, and now, deplo now it has been deployed over two-thirds of Mexican states, uh, is when we witness this, this rise, this dramatic rise in, in violent crime. And even when the army is successful, and this is the, the, the critical point here, when mm. the army is successful in killing or capturing one of these drug kingpins, is when we see more, more rise of uh, escalation in violence, because then you have the fight for succession within the, the, the criminal organizations, or other organizations try to uh, take advantage of, of that situation and, and, and invade violence, territories. Yeah. So it's, it, whatever you look at it, it's an utter failure what we're, we're missing as a strategy in Mexico. Yeah, I just want to follow up with you, uh, just one question. Demand from the United States for drugs has largely been um, a, re a reason for a long time, and something that the Mexican government and all the way down have said, if you take away the demand, then it, is, how much has that to do with it? Demand is steady. The demand yeah. for drugs has, up, been, down, has been steady in the United States. We haven't seen a, a drop in demand. We have seen a shift, though, in the preference for certain drugs. For a while, cocaine was actually going down uh, as, a, as a drug of choice in the United States. It's still down from, from historic levels, but we have seen an increase in the use of methamphetamines and lately uh, mm. opioids. Uh, but when you see, for example, 93% of, of the heroin in, uh, that is... Uh, uh, caught in the United States comes from Mexico. 75% uh, of the cocaine that comes into the United States goes through Mexico from Colombia. Uh, and we have seen a, a doubling of cocaine production in, in Colombia since 2013. So the problem is actually getting worse. Under no cri criteria whatsoever, we can say that we have seen an improvement in the fight against uh, drug use or, or drug trafficking. Alejandro, how much is uh, corruption of local police forces and, and the like uh, and politicians uh, still uh, allowing this violence and obviously uh, uh, dealing and, uh, and drug cartels to go unchecked? Well, corruption is certainly a huge problem in Mexico and the incapacity of the police and the criminal justice institutions and the prosecutors to do their job has to do with corruption and has to do with the political use of these institutions, certainly and without a doubt. However, both the corruption and the incapacity of police and prosecutors were there before the violence. And so they can't explain the violence. I think that it is the combination of poor justice and security institutions, which are both corrupt and not very capable and highly politicized, combined with the militarized or the very mm. violent enforcement on prohibition that gives us the cocktail that we have. But the, the trigger was the decision to militarize. The, the, and the decision to militarize, I have to say it here, uh, as, as uh, uh, was mentioned, uh, Mexico was at a particularly good moment in its history regarding violence. We had the lowest homicide rate ever recorded in our history when President Felipe Calderón decided to militarize large portions of the country. That decision was not a technical decision. It was a highly politicized yeah. decision. It was a political decision in the aftermath of a very contested election. David, and one constant that we yeah. have seen is the politicization of these institutions even today. And that, I think, is one of the things that needs to be brought to the table. The weakness okay. of our criminal institutions and security institutions has to do with their corruption, yes, but most importantly with their politicization and their political use. David was shaking his head there, so... Uh, well, I, I, I slightly disagree. I mean, the, the, the increase in violence among organized crime groups dates back to the 1990s. Uh, there was a period in the 1970s and 80s where there was very little violence among organized crime groups. But in 2002, 2003, we saw the arrests of major drug trafficking figures like Benjamin Arellano Felix and uh, Osiel Cárdenas. Uh, and it was in the, that context from, the, from 2002 to 2006 that mm. we started to see a dramatic increase 
in incidents of violence among organized crime groups. And it was in part that which the Calderon administration was responding to. But I agree with Alejandro's point that Calderon's decision to ramp up uh, the security response to Mexico's organized crime groups was a major catastrophe insofar as it, it uh, greatly increased violence, it greatly increased uh, human rights uh, abuses. Uh, but I think uh, the story is much more subtle, of course, than we can uh, get into too much detail uh, in the context of this discussion. Erica, what about the... But can I add something? Sorry, here? yes, Alejandro, please do. Well, no, that, I think that that's precisely what needs to be pointed out. In, it is true that we had uh, increasing incidents of violence amongst cartels during the 90s and the 2000s, but they were highly localized. Yeah. Even mm. the larger crises, which were there when Calderón arrived, were very focalized in Michoacán and in Tamaulipas. They were regional, violent, uh, uh, regional crises in violence. The decision to militarize what did was a sort of metastasis of the violence. It brought the violence that was local, increasing at a local level in very specific regions for very specific local circumstances, and made it a national problem. And I think that is what needs to be pointed out. The fact is, we had the lowest homicide rate ever in history in 2006. And two years later, we had a homicide rate, which is similar to the one we have now, which was threefold as large. Eric, you wanted to say something on that? Well, I, I think we're getting to another key point, that we tend to focus on the traffic of cocaine from Colombia to the United States. Mm. But there's, you know, what the violence is localized, and that's not always about cocaine. That's about other things. It can be even about avocados. It uh, can be Mexico, about right? avocados. We right. know a lot of us don't even talk about drug trafficking organizations anymore because they're diversified. They're dealing with petroleum. So they're dealing with men. It's gangsterism, not just about drugs. Uh, there are local criminal organizations, and they tend to be more violent because they're fighting over control of their particular territory. There's nothing, no reason why bringing cocaine from Colombia to New York has to be violent along the way. Sure, they use violence strategically at different points. When needed. But the to, yeah. real yeah. violence is at the local level, and sometimes it's not even about drugs. Sometimes it's about smuggling people, sometimes it's about extortion, sometimes it's about a car theft, it's other things. That's what drives up violence as well. I'm not saying okay. uh, uh, militarization didn't contribute, of course, but the, the, the issue is localized and focalized, much like David Shirk said. I, I, I think this point is fascinating, the diversification of, of cartels. Well, God, they are d diversifying for sure, but it's, it's still the drug business is their major source of income. And yeah. we're talking about, uh, I mean, there are wild estimates out there. It's not that you can look at their tax returns to see exactly how much money they're making, but we're talking about billions of dollars. I mean, we're talking about from six billions to some people even mentioned $20 billion a year that they make. Uh, out of the drug business. Uh, most of it has to do with cocaine, and there is a study by the RAN Institution that says like a third, approximately a third of their, of their business has to do with cocaine, uh, another 17% for marijuana, another 17 probably that has decreased and since that study was published. Uh, Methamphetamine is a new business that they are uh, going into. Uh, uh, is it? It is estimated that 60% uh, of the methamphetamine business in the United States is controlled by, by mm. Mexican cartels. So we're talking about extremely powerful organizations because of the drug money. If you take away the drug money, certainly they can still, uh, you know, like traffic avocados or uh, they can still engage in, in extortion and so on. But the amount of money they will, they will have and the power they will derive from that, uh, from that money will be much less. Do you think uh, legalization this, of certain this drugs? A, uh, Nathan, this yes, is sorry, a, David, go a, a ahead. Point, going to the legalization of drugs, this is a point that no one has really, uh, I think, uh, talked too much about, which is the fact that we have seen the legalization par or partial legalization of marijuana uh, in many parts of the United States. Yeah. Uh, and that is, in many ways, cutting into uh, the pie uh, that drug traffic of, of uh, Mexican drug trafficking uh, revenues. Uh, and that shrinking of the pie has contributed to this phenomenon of diversification into other drugs like heroin uh, and uh, other predatory crimes like extortion. Uh, and so uh, to the, we, we talk about legalization of drugs as, as a way of depriving uh, drug, 
cr organized crime groups of resources to, to do bad things. Uh, but the, the problem is that in the short term, at least, if we were to legalize drugs tomorrow, many of these organizations would continue to go out and, and do uh, look for illicit activities that would bring them revenues, because McDonald's just doesn't pay that well. Well, Alejandro, well, I mean, couldn't they go to the jet? I mean, anyway, Alejandro, you wanted to say something? Yes, um, I think that uh, actually both stories are true. Uh, saying that drugs is the bulk of the problem, the, the illicit drug market is the bulk of the problem because it's the bulk of the resources, and there is a phenomenon of, of diversification, both are true. Um, what we see is that at the origin, the main business, by and large, if not the only business, is the drug money. Once they right. start to develop, so to speak, private armies in order to defend themselves from the uh, militarization and from the war amongst each other, then they develop the capacity to exert violence beyond the protection of the drug, uh, right. uh, the, the drugs that they were Excellent. moving. Yeah. So basically the story, if you look at it, in, in the evolution of the story is you had people who were moving drugs from South America and from Mexico into the United States, who at some point had the incentive to build and develop private armies. And that incentive began for many different reasons at a small scale with the fragmentation of the political system in Mexico, with plurality, with plurality. But in a large scale, it really kicked in with the militarization. So once they had that incentive, they invested in these private armies okay. and grew important private armies. Once you have a private army, why use it only for drugs? Why not extort? Why not use it also to drain the avocado economy, et cetera, et cetera? So the answer is, Drugs and legalizing drugs and regulating the market is a necessary but not sufficient condition to ameliorate the violence. Uh, we need to drain those resources away from them, but it's not going to be sufficient in the short run. Eric, uh, uh, Penny Neto is not running on legalizing drugs, right? Uh, no, uh, he's, been re he's been and, very resistant to that. And there are elections coming up. Right. How much of the political paralysis in Mexico in terms of uh, the coalition and the like do you think um, hampers new ideas on, on how to tackle this problem? You know, interestingly enough, and, 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 and uh, uh, Alejandro would probably know the best because he's uh, there, um, interesting enough, the questions of violence and, 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 and drug trafficking and all that are really not top issues. Uh, even if, for even a though lot people, of people. So you see pictures on TV well, of people no, hanging no. from billboards. Yeah, yeah. And, well, that that actually is is changing as well. There are issues for the population. I mean to say, but they're not being debated in a serious way amongst the candidates. It's like a bit like gun they, control in they, America. They <laughs> have no innovative ideas. Right. I think Andres Manuel proposed amnesty for certain drug traffickers, you know, but uh, there really is not much of a debate amongst the candidates. It's a top concern, violence and, dr and, and organized crime amongst the people, but it really is not getting the resonance in the campaign and debate. I, I want to raise a couple of points going back to the, to the topic of legalization uh -huh. and is the way, how this is a self-defeating strategy, the war on drugs. If you look at the price of a kilo of cocaine, I don't uh, know the price, in, but... In, uh, <laughs> in Colombia, right. it's approximately $2,000, right. a, a little bit more or less. If you look at how that same kilo of cocaine can be sold in the streets of the United States, retail price, it goes up to $100,000. Right, so the so markup is huge. The markup is huge because of prohibition, precisely because when you prohibit something, the value of that product lies mostly on the tr cost of trafficking. Prohibition here, I mean, everything... Yeah. So, by raising the, the price of, of the product, you are actually raising the, the incentives, the profits that you can get if you go into that business. And that's why this is a self-defeating uh, policy, because the more resources you spend, and even the more successful you are by uh, interindicting uh, uh, drugs, the only result that you're going to get is raising the price of the drugs and making the, the market more valuable. Uh, there is a concept in, in economics that call elasticity of demand. You mm -hmm. know, if, the, if a product, sometimes a product, if you raise the price, the consumption doesn't necessarily go down. Yes. Because, and this is the case of drugs. So that's why raising the price of a, uh, of a drug, which is the logic is, if you raise the price of cocaine, demand will go down. The yeah. demand will go down. That's not necessarily the case. But when it comes to addiction, studies. obviously, that doesn't And the yeah. tragedy for a, from a Mexican perspective, from a Mexican point of view, is that if you look at consumption rates in Mexico of drugs. They're among the lowest 
in the hemisphere. They have ticked up. They have ticked up from a very low base. So the problem for Mexico when it comes to drugs is uh, yeah, uh, about legalizing drugs. It's not consumption. It's trafficking. It's the violence that the trafficking generates. Okay, I want to I want to move on a little bit and just talk about what needs to be done. Um, David, um, I'm going to play this clip from uh, Raúl Benítez uh, Manuel, a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, talking about improving the whole system of justice as well. And then I, I want to take, get your take off the back. Let's hear that. We need to improve the justice system, fight corruption, be very tough on politicians who help criminals. It is very hard for good judges to deliver strong sentences without negotiating with corrupt politicians because Mexico, narco politics and politics have a great influence on the judiciary. David, the professor seemed to suggest there that the, the whole body, body politic has been affected uh, with, the, with the drug money. Is that, is that your idea and uh, is that your belief and uh, where do we go to, to improve things? Well, uh, this, the, the point that drug money is, uh, of, oh, that Mexico is awash with drug money and that it corrupts the criminal justice system, uh, that it corrupts the political system, I think is, is true. And, and if we were to legalize, the ability of criminal organizations to, to corrupt the system would diminish dramatically. Uh, the, the, the question, I think, for our, our uh, for Mexico, uh, the policy question, is why Mexico doesn't simply legalize drugs this year, tomorrow. Uh, why not? Uh, and the, the reason they can't is that uh, there would be severe re repercussions, I think, from the United States. Absolutely, so that yeah. debate also has to play out in the United States. But on the question of the Mexican criminal justice system, you know, uh, many organizations, our organization, uh, uh, have been working for years to try to promote uh, increased professionalism and integrity in uh, the, the Mexican justice system uh, to, to deal with these problems of corruption, but also uh, ineptitude, frankly, okay. uh, among prosecutors, police, uh, and others. And it's a, this is a massive project. Uh, building up a criminal justice system uh, takes a lot of effort, a lot of political will, uh, and a lot of resources. Um, and most importantly, it, it's about creating incentives uh, within police departments for prosecutors um, and uh, even for okay. politicians to actually uh, try to move the, the, the needle forward on improving the system of justice. Okay, and that uh, okay. has to come. Just, Alejandro, uh, yes, think. you wanted to say, uh, add yeah. to that. No, uh, I just want to say, I mean, I think it's correct. I think that the, the corruption and ineptitude of police prosecutors and even the judiciary is certainly at the core of the problem. But it's not drug money that made them so. It is political no, use of those institutions that predates. Mm. That, that, that predates. So the fact that the democratic transition left police departments, prosecutorial offices, and part of the judiciary, because the judiciary was uh, uh, reformed, uh, but mostly police and prosecutorial offices, they were left untouched with the democratization process. Why? Because all the political parties, you know, they were happy to, to compete in elections, but they were also happy to then come into power and use arbitrarily for their own political uh, objectives the institutions of government. And we've seen it even in electoral times. In 2006, President Fox tried okay. to derail the candidacy of López Obrador by using the judiciary. Okay. This year, we're seeing we're President Peña trying to derail uh, candidate Anaya. <laughs> so the politicization okay. of the justice system is still there. And that's a key issue. Uh, interesting but point to end. That history, to that the history can repeat itself, uh, uh, or not repeat itself, but definitely rhyme. Uh, Alejandro, David, uh, and our two guests here in the studio, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Nathan King in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching. See you soon.